So maybe we'll start and other people can join later as we are talking. So welcome everyone to this working session entitled Overcoming the Difficulties of Field Surveys. Um, as you know, the specific context of this year led a lot of organizations to conduct surveys with the objective to assess or at least attempt to assess the impact of the crisis at different levels, especially at MFI level and at end client level. So for some organizations, it was maybe the first time. For some others, it was just additional surveys above others. But in any case, usually we know that each of us faces a variety of challenges when conducting surveys. So today's session is dedicated to the sharing of experiences. This is why it is a working session. So it means that we will not spend too much time on presentations, but more on discussions. So discussions will involve the three speakers who are with us today. So first, Fanny Serre, Group Head of Marketing at Advance. Peter Zitterly, Senior Financial Sector Specialist at CIGAP. And Kevin Zitzas Desplant, Social Performance Specialist at Oiko Credit. So discussions will, will involve the three speakers, but also you as attendees. So I will just give you an overview of how the session will look like. First, each of us as a speaker will quickly introduce an example of the kind of surveys we are or have been recently involved in. And then we will discuss three main questions which may apply to both surveys with MFIs or surveys with end clients. So for each topic, each speaker will share his or her perspective and then the floor will be open to the audience if we have time and I hope we will have time. Uh, so now I think you are muted, but if you want to intervene, just raise your hand or write in the chat and uh, we'll unmute you. Uh, so we'll try to keep 15 minutes for each of the three topics to finish, to finish on time. And I have the ungrateful role to manage time in this session. Uh, so now let's start. And we'll start with a presentation by Peter Zitterly from CIGAP, who will introduce his experience with the recent and still ongoing Pulse survey. So Peter, I'll let you the floor. Yes. Thank you very much, Matilda, and thank you, uh, thanks everyone for, for joining. Um, so the CGAP Pulse Survey is a data collection effort that we've been running since the beginning of June. Uh, and it is still ongoing, although we're actually just wrapping it up. We launched the final wave of the survey yesterday. Um, it is a survey of MFIs, so not of their clients. And the purpose is to show how the industry has been faring through the pandemic. Um, the origins of this survey really go back to the consultations that we had with, with many different stakeholders during the spring. The pandemic was spreading very quickly. There was a real sense of urgency around mounting a response from MFIs, from funders, from policymakers. Um, and people really feared an acute crisis in the sector, uh, not least a, a liquidity gap that people were worried could sort of spiral, turn the industry into, into a downward spiral. Um, and everybody wanted data to see whether that was happening. Uh, and if so, where was happening? And the problem was we didn't have the data. Uh, many people had lots of data on their particular MFIs and they were beefing that up with additional reporting uh, instruments and requirements on the MFIs, but they didn't have visibility on the rest of the sector. And so they couldn't see the full picture. Nobody could. Um, we were involved in various conversations around pooling data on a common platform, taking what everybody has already and bringing it together to create that full picture. But uh, some of you were involved in those too, um, and those conversations didn't really go anywhere. So we concluded in the end that someone really needed to just go out and collect the data and share it, and, and it might as well be us. So <laughs> in about a month's time, we sort of put together and, and deployed uh, the Pulse survey. Um, we'll talk a little bit more in detail about the survey and why we set it up the way we did, but just to get the highlights and, and the key points are on the screen already. Uh, the, the survey collects both qualitative and quantitative information. Um, it is self-reported by the MFIs themselves. We did that through a digital instrument that we'll show a little bit later. And we partnered with MFR, who a lot of you probably already know. They host the Atlas platform, which is kind of the successor to, to the mixed market and, and the space. Uh, initially, we ran it bi-monthly, so every two weeks. 
but subsequently we, or bi-weekly, I should say, every two weeks, but subsequently we switched to, to monthly reporting. Um, overall, we got almost 400 MFIs participating, about $19 billion total assets between them. So pretty good chunk of the space, reasonably representative across geographies and so forth. However, participation has declined over time as we, as we expected. It was always uh, thought of as a short-term effort and that's uh, hence why we're also preparing to, to wind it down and close out at the end of the year. Um, in terms of outputs from the survey, we have published various findings and analysis on, on our website. We also created this public dashboard that I hope everyone has, has seen and tried out. I can put the link in the chat in a moment. Um, and we also created private dashboards for the MFIs themselves to benchmark their performance against others. Um, let me leave it for the, that for now, and then we can get into a bit more during the session. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Peter. So now I will let the floor to the next one, who is Fanny. So Fanny, it's your turn. Yes, um, thank you, Mathilde. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, happy to be here with you today uh, on behalf of Advance. Uh, so Advance is the microfinance uh, network. We are operating in nine uh, countries across Asia and Africa, and we are headquartered in Paris. Um, over the past two years, we've really straightened our uh, ability and capabilities internally to run uh, surveys and, uh, and field research. Um, and and the, um, we are doing three kinds of surveys, but I will focus on two um, today. So the first kind, which I'm not going into too much details, but is more like when we develop a new product or service for clients, we are testing with them uh, what's going on and, and their needs, obviously, to make sure that we are tailoring our approach to uh, client needs and, and solving their problems. Um, and, and there are two surveys, two type of work that we've been doing over the past years. Uh, the first one is a global satisfaction survey, which we ran um, last year uh, for the first time uh, with a global tool, uh, which was implemented uh, in the same way with the same questionnaire and the same um, uh, way for customers to, to reply to this uh, survey everywhere in our eight out of nine uh, subsidiaries. We've done it completely internally. Uh, we've designed uh, the overall survey and the overall approach at head office level and uh, we've asked and partners with um, our local teams to implement it through our, our call centers. We then gathered all the data through the same platform, uh, SurveyMonkey, um, and then we analyzed all the results uh, centrally. Um, this year, uh, during the, 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 the start of the pandemic, we, we really wanted to capture the impact of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic on our clients. And so we decided to run a global survey again um, uh, to, to, to capture that impact. But we decided to take a different approach. Um, and given the scale of, of, the, of the crisis that was, um, uh, that was um, touching and, uh, and impacting all our clients in all our locations, um, we decided to choose a different way of, of um, undertaking that survey and uh, we wanted to associate ourselves to a, a more industry-wide um, initiative. So we, we, we uh, partnered with um, 60 decibel uh, to use the questionnaire that we slightly customized but really, really a little bit on me um, to run this impact survey that other uh, partners, SPTF partners have also uh, run, um, like EDA, for example, um, and we ran it in seven subsidiaries. So we've, we've really relied on external capabilities to implement it. Uh, we relied on a methodology that was uh, provided um, and capabilities provided by 60 decibel. Um, the only thing I would say uh, which was quite uh, uh, common to both uh, examples uh, is the fact that we definitely needed capabilities, centralized capabilities to actually um, uh, analyze uh, the results and make sure we could uh, send back and share back all those results and insights we are getting uh, from those surveys with all our teams locally. So if, if I just step back a little bit and, and just say, what have we learned? Um, what are the key challenges we've actually had to uh, overcome um, no matter which type of, of, um, of methodology we, we, we were uh, using uh, to gather those insights? First, as I was saying, um, even if we rely on an external partner to run that kind of survey, we actually need to have strong internal capabilities, both at head office level to make sure that we can coordinate everything and be a support, strong support for our 
uh, teams locally, but also locally, uh, both in terms of implementing the survey, whether it is uh, through uh, quant and, and through call centers or qualitative survey, field survey, face-to-face uh, -face survey, um, interviewing our end clients, um, or whether it is about analyzing the results, summarizing the insights, and make sure it transforms into actionable insights and an action plan for them. So end-to-end -end capabilities is really strong, is really needed and, and something we absolutely need to work on if we want to overcome the challenges of, of a feed survey. Uh, we also need, uh, and, and this session is absolutely great for, for doing that, uh, we need to share internally, uh, sure, across countries, which is something we are doing more and more uh, to help build up those capabilities, but we also actually need uh, to share with our peer and, and more industry-wide, which is uh, what I think um, this COVID-19 impact survey that, that we ran thanks to uh, 60 decibel and through the SPTF platform uh, is, is absolutely bringing a lot of value added. So I think the, the, those are the three key points uh, I wanted to make. We, we can share uh, more obviously um, in, in the next uh, few minutes when if you have questions and, and during the discussions, but basically um, having internal capabilities is key to make sure that we can continue running and getting the value uh, from any field survey that, that we are undertaking. Okay, thank you very much, Fanny. And indeed, I guess we will uh, address all these issues later in the discussions as well. Uh, first, I will uh, let also Kevin introduce what they are doing at Oiko Credit. So let me show yeah, your slides and it's your right. turn, Kevin. Yeah. Thank you, Mathilde, and thank you, Fanny and Peter, for, for giving really the perspective from uh, already two very different levels. And I guess Oiko Credit is kind of in between that as an investor, um, a cooperative. So uh, when the um, pandemic started, one of our first concerns is really, you know, what's happening at client level, of course, also as MFI level. Um, and uh, we really wanted uh, these very segmented surveys to go out. So we cooperated with the... Uh, um, SPTF and uh, Think International and also looked at 60 decibels. Um, and we really uh, were very eager for that, those surveys to, to be used like one format. Um, what we ran into though, however, was that we already had MFIs that were doing their own surveys. That was one thing. And then uh, costs were an issue, right? And time for the MFIs. So what we ran into is that a lot of MFIs were really, uh, at that moment in time in March, really um, didn't have the resources, they said, uh, to um, conduct the survey at that moment in time. Um, so what I want to take you then, and we're still in, in the process of working with those that really didn't have the capacity at that time to still embed surveys in their systems, that's one. But what I want to take you back into then is something called the Oikyo Credit Client Outcomes Program, uh, which actually started a longer time ago. And it's actually about getting the same type of information, not about segmented information at client level, and how can we support uh, MFIs um, to actually uh, collect that data in a way that makes sense for them as an institution uh, and also sense for the for the end clients. Um, so basically what we did is uh, we worked with 20 MFIs and collected together with the MFI data on 2 million uh, clients. Um, it was very much meant to be a participatory uh, venture with the MFIs for the sustainability of that exercise, right? Um, and very much like uh, any... Um, uh, corporate would like marketing intelligence data on your clients in such a way that you can actually uh, create actionable actions, the right products and services. So that was the goal uh, from an MFI perspective. Um, and what I just have on the screen is very much uh, just a, kind of the activity steps that we went through. Uh, Oiko Credit invests in about 460 uh, financial institutions, most of them MFIs, and then also a number of uh, non-MFIs in agri and renewable energy. So this is only about the MFIs. Um, getting a willingness to participate, because of course you have to put resources and time into um, checking out what you have in your systems, uh, the data, 
um, because we really wanted to make sure we're not creating something new, but creating an addition on top of uh, data that the institution already has in their system. They're already collecting. A lot of times, uh, we also, at our institution, we collect a lot of data, and then we don't do anything with it, right, with that data. So it was really finding the available data. And in order to do that, the MFIs would send a, a pre-screening set of data, like really uh, the raw data sets that they would have either in their MIS or even sometimes in their Excel sheets, right? Um, then getting the whole discussion about uh, making sure there is NDA signed, because of course this is a privileged data, a confidential data, it's a client data, uh, terms of reference, that took quite a lot of time and it needed to be really set well. Then um, what we, the next step was actually to prepare a lot of um, cleaning of the data and prepare kind of steps for a one week workshop. So basically what we would do is, is go and do an in-house workshop with a multifunctional team at the MFI. So not just the social performance person, but also the IT person, uh, the marketing, and at the beginning, uh, uh, a meeting with uh, the CEO also, or the MD, um, because this really was a venture, a cross-disciplinary venture, right? It's, uh, it's data information you want, it's credit portfolio information, um, and also audit. Audit was also included. Um, and even HR, if, if that was necessary. So you would actually have a team of about 10 people in the room for truly a 724 type of venture. Uh, uh, because in the evenings we would be uh, crunching uh, the data, preparing for the next session, because a lot of times you wouldn't know what you would actually be doing that day, right? We really started with the information of uh, the MFI. Um, by the end of the week, the MFI would have prepared a dashboard with a report that they knew would be the type of report that their management team would want to see. Uh, with the type of data that they could actually get out of their systems in a format that would make sense and provide some kind of actionable uh, information for the institution. Now, that was the perfect story. Uh, usually, there were gaps somewhere along the line, and that's why there was always an action plan, a follow-up, because some of the gaps would be, hey, the data isn't in the right place for which it can be easily extracted, or wow, this department didn't realize the other unit actually had that data, but how could they uh, access it? That was another one. Or wow, we've actually been working with the wrong something or other, right? And sometimes it would even be as simple as uh, not everyone actually has a laptop or um, Excel skills uh, need to be updated. Uh, that would be in day one. Uh, the, the staff would also be helping each other how to make a pivot table. Uh, things like that. So uh, lots of things happened and it was very tailored because each MFI was quite different. So that's in a nutshell. <laughs> that the, the, the good news story is that let's say from the 20 MFIs, uh, seven really became exemplary or were already exemplary, just became even better. Uh, and um, I would probably say about half of them uh, continued using the action plans and the dashboards or adjusted them um, and now are, are continue to adjust. So from our perspective, uh, that worked quite well. There were a lot of gaps though, um, and it was more complicated than anticipated. Uh, and the same goes for the surveys that we are uh, working on now. So it's work in progress. Okay, great. Thank you, Kevin. So it's now my turn to introduce the type of work we are doing in ADA. So I will do it quickly to make sure we have enough time to discuss, but just to introduce two examples of recent surveys uh, we have been conducting. Actually, we are still conducting them right now. So it's two surveys on the topic of impact of COVID-19 crisis. And one is at MFI level, the other one is at end client level. Um, so, 
and I'm talking uh, from the perspective of ADA as a TA provider, not uh, as an investment advisor. So it's only uh, from the TA side that we are doing uh, these two surveys. So uh, the first one, we, we do this MFI survey in cooperation with Fondation Gramin Crédit Agricole and Impulse. And the scope of this survey is all our uh, partner MFIs, which makes a total of 300 MFIs. And we managed to get 100 answering uh, depending on the round of surveys, but we also have a declining number of answering MFIs uh, over rounds. Uh, indeed, if we talk about methodology, so this survey consists mainly in 10 questions, uh, mostly qualitative questions, which go uh, through SurveyMonkey. Uh, it's also self-reported data by MFIs, just as in the case of Pulse survey. And we also organized several rounds of surveys. It was uh, one per month at the beginning. Now it's more one every two months because we don't have so much time <laughs> to spend on this. It's the same uh, same issue. Uh, we mainly, mainly do the analysis using Excel and we only do cross-sectional analysis, we, which means we analyze data at the end of each round of survey. We want to do a more longitudinal analysis at the end um, of this exercise, but it means at the end of this year. And how we use uh, the data collected. So first, we use them internally to better know the situation of our partner MFIs. Um, then we share the results with the MFIs as well to make sure they get something from their participation to this survey, because as we can understand, it was our decision to organize these surveys. So we want to, to share the results with them and to make sure they can do something from these results. And then, of course, we uh, create publications for the sector. Um, so this is the first uh, type of survey, and this is something pretty new. Actually, we, we haven't done this before uh, this way, so it was the first time for us with uh, this kind of MFI level uh, surveys. And then regarding the other type of survey, so actually it's the same as the one introduced by Fanny for advance. So we have also this uh, this SPTF client survey tool that we use uh, through 60 decibels with three MFIs in Africa. Uh, and so it works the same way as for advanced. 60 decibels collects and analyze the data. They use their own platform to do that, which is Qualtrics. Uh, and they do cross-sectional and longitudinal analysis. So we can see the result of each round and we can see the evolution of the results over time because there are several rounds of surveys as well. And actually we also use the same questionnaire with other MFIs in Asia and Latin America, but it, it has just started in Asia and you, it will start only now in Latin America. And uh, so we use the same questionnaire, but we, we go through consultants this way who use uh, the Validata platform uh, created by Finca and which is open to every organization which wants to use this tool, this SPTF client survey tool in this crisis time. Uh, and so in that case, we will collect the results of these other surveys. And in the end, we want to analyze everything together. So it means we will also do specific analysis at our level. And the idea is also to publish something uh, by ADA, of course, but first we share the results with each MFI which participated in the survey. The idea is to make sure they can appropriate the results and we discuss with them on how they can use these results to build a response to the crisis for their clients. But indeed, it's uh, as Fanny said already, it's not because you organize everything with 60 decibels that you don't need resources both internally and at the level of the MFI to make sure results are understood and then are used concretely. But we will uh, probably talk more about that a bit later. And uh, finally, just to explain how these data are used, we also feed the global dashboard, which has been created by 60 decibels and which is accessible online. And so the results are available to everyone publicly. Uh, just to explain that we also uh, do other kinds of surveys at ADA, uh, especially with end clients, but we'll focus on these two examples uh, for now. 
And now that we have explained the type of survey we are involved in, uh, let's start the discussions. So we have three main questions to address. Um, and of course, the audience will be able to participate during the discussion. So we have three main topics we would like to address during this discussion time. First topic is about the type of data we collect and how we decide of this type of data, who may make the decision or what drives the decision to collect uh, such type of data. Then we'll talk about data collection methodologies. And finally, we'll talk about data analysis and use, what are the challenges to make sure data and results are used and what are the solutions each of us has found so far. So, um, let's start with the first question. So I will ask this question first to the speakers and maybe first to Peter to give uh, the perspective of surveys at MFI level. So how do, the, do you decide what type of data you want to collect? Is it you as supporting organizations or investors or uh, holding who decides the type of data to collect or survey to, to implement? Or sometimes does it come from the FSP or FSPs directly? And what is the consequence on the type of data to collect? Do you collect harmonized data, customized data, and what are the pros and cons of each type of data? So Peter, you may start maybe. Thanks so much, Mathilde. Um, so for the poll survey, one of our core goals was to make it as easy as possible for the NFIs to report. Uh, we knew they were under a lot of stress already. We didn't want to add to that burden. We knew they were reporting loads already to the funders and HQs and regulators. We didn't want to add to that burden. So that goal led us to a couple of clear decisions about, about the quantitative indicators. So we collect quantitative and qualitative. And I'll touch on both. Um, for the quant side, we've really stayed closely to the most common indicators. We only use standard definitions from the consensus guidelines. Um, we also collected the various templates that other funders were using to harmonize their sort of additional reporting around COVID. And we try to align as much as possible with as many as possible of, of those existing um, new, new standards, let's say. Um, and that alignment and adherence to standards had several important benefits in our mind. Uh, First and foremost, NFIs would be familiar with the indicators. They would understand what they're being asked. Um, important since self, self supported. Um, many or most NFIs would already have the data ready from reports that they were preparing anyway, so it would be easier for them to, to pull out the statistics. Um, ideally, we would be able to pull data directly from those reports, existing reports, and spare the NFIs the burden altogether. Now, that depended on a number of of things, and, and we can talk more about that later around sharing the data. Um, but that was at least an option. Um, and at least uh, in looking at the data, our audiences, MFIs, funders, regulators, uh, would be familiar with, with the data. They would know what the indicators were, how to interpret them. They would easily be able to compare them to in-house figures and, on the same indicators and stuff. So those are all really important objectives that, that drove our, our harmonization and standardization, our choice of standard indicators to the extent possible. That being said, we did want to add a number of qualitative indicators, um, and there are a lot fewer standards. So, for instance, we wanted to explore what measures have MFIs been taking in response to COVID, uh, client moratoria, rescheduling of loans, pulling back lending, branch closures, staff reductions, expanding use of phone or digital channels, all those kinds of things. Have they talked to their funders about leniency for, for their debt repayment? Have they got any agreements on that? Questions of, of that nature. We also wanted to understand how what, what regulators in their markets were doing. Uh, were there lockdowns? Were they mandatory? Was there forbearance uh, rules? Uh, were re regulatory reporting or supervisory standards being tightened or loosened um, and so forth? And finally, we wanted to get a read on how the practitioners themselves were feeling about the situation, the real sort of pulse metrics, if you will. So how worried are they about liquidity running out? How, how worried are they about running into solvency issues? How do they feel about the state of the sector? How bad is it, right? Uh, all of these uh, more, more uh, qualitative questions that we wanted to get at that you can't get from the financial metrics in the same way. Um, and for those indicators, there really are no standards, at least that we're aware of until we kind of have to make them up. 
um, and we're fortunate to have deep expertise in CGAP that, that we can rely on in that. So I think it's fair to say, and this goes partly to the question Sam posed in the chat, um, that the qualitative indicators were a lot more problematic to respond, presumably because they were not standard, right? Um, because of the digital tool that we used, we could see exactly where people were stopping or dropping off the survey, and often it was on those qualitative indicators. In the first waves, we, we, we also had people rate the survey and tell us if they if thought it was difficult, and if so, what was difficult, and again, tended to be the qualitative indicators. Not only, but it tended to be that. Um, even apparently simple questions like, how is the sector doing on a scale from one to 10? really seem to confuse people. And they, they a lot of people, surprising number of people didn't sort of know what to answer or, or how to do that. So um, they were clearly more challenging. That said, I think they were also some of the most useful and powerful. I mean, for us being able to show that a third of MFIs are worried about solvency in the next six months, that's really clear and compelling information that you can, to some extent, maybe glean from the data, but not in that same way direct from the horse's mouth. Um, getting a sense of how many MFIs are talking to their funders about these things. Are they getting uh, a good reception from funders and reaching agreements? It's incredibly valuable to, to try and understand. So we're hoping that once the survey wraps up, we can also use some of these qualitative data points for to explore outcomes. So did MFIs fare better if they took certain types of actions or if there were certain kinds of regulatory responses in their market? Um, did MFIs who really worried about liquidity and solvency come through better if they got forbearance from funders and how much better? Those kinds of, of questions. Um, and hopefully it can also tell us something about the value of, of this real-time qualitative data because this crisis, remember, was moving incredibly fast and everybody wanted data yesterday, but um, that's not how financial metrics work, right? They take time to compute and, and to validate. Now, and that's especially true if you want to collect data from a wide range of MFIs, large and small, strong and weak. So the big ones, they could tell you end of month data, you know, on the first of the next month or within days, but the weakest ones, they might need a month or even more to produce those figures, right? Some of them only calculate certain things on a quarterly basis, not a monthly basis. So, and we had to set the bar low so that we wouldn't skew the sample uh, to exclude those smaller and weaker MFIs. So I think that was a major constraint for us uh, on the financial and the quantitative data. And I think it remains a constraint for, for everyone. And I think that's perhaps where qualitative data can play a role because those data really are real time, right? They are as of the moment somebody presses the button. Um, and so we could collect data mid July that would show financial indicators from end of May. But the quality indicators are from, you know, July 17th. Uh, that's a big difference, especially in a, in a crisis situation. So to me, I think there's an important area of research around the use of of real-time qualitative indicators as proxies for slower moving quantitative metrics. And I'm hoping that our data can, can maybe contribute to that. Um, one last point to make about the, our approach was that we needed to collect a lot of indicators, but we also needed to keep the survey short. And that was a tough circle to square. And we took what might be called a dynamic approach to the instrument. So we had sort of this master list of indicators that we wanted to collect over time. But then we spread different indicators over different waves of the survey, including the baseline and sort of descriptive indicators that you tend to ask about in wave one, right? But we spread them out over the first sort of four waves just to, to even it out a little bit. Uh, and which indicator went in which wave was based on a number of things. So how important is the indicator? Uh, what can you use the indicator to compute various kinds of, of ratios? So, uh, we, we sort of had a whole map laid out of what we could calculate if we got certain variables to, to feed in. Um, how frequently do you really need updates on any given indicator? So cash on hand, that can move really quickly. You want it as often as possible. Number of borrowers, uh, not so much, right? It's a slow moving indicator. Maybe you need it every quarter, maybe every two quarters. Um, so, so those were important. And, and then how frequently do MFIs calculate the different uh, indicators. As mentioned, there's a big difference between the bigger ones and the smaller ones in, in that regard, and we have to set the bar low. So when we had sort of the overall frequency nailed down for every indicator, we then spread them around across different ways to even it out. And I think that deliberate approach served us really well. I think it allowed us to collect and, and compute a very large number of variables while also keeping each survey wave relatively light for respondents. Um, 
of course, it also has drawbacks. We made mistakes along the way that we, that we learned from. But overall, I think that's an approach that uh, is worth exploring further. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. I just take this opportunity to, to answer something you said. Uh, it's interesting to, to see that the problem MFIs had was on qualitative questions. Because on our side, with our MFI or our survey with MFIs, we decided to do completely the contrary. Uh, to ask only qualitative questions to avoid self-reported quantitative data, which could be not accurate. So we decided to ask only qualitative questions and maybe because MFIs were used to it, they always answered everything and uh, it didn't seem so complicated for them to answer this type uh, of questions, but very interesting to know that actually. And uh, yeah, and because we knew that in the Pulse survey, we were co you were collecting quantitative data, we decided to, to keep only qualitative questions, maybe one or two um, yeah, overall questions on a portfolio at risk, for instance, but never the exact number. We never asked for the exact number because we were afraid the, the data could be not accurate, actually. So, yeah, so maybe because we have this Just time... A, one very quick point on that to say is uh, that it depends a lot on who's who's responding to the survey. So mm -hmm. some of those questions, I think if you're the CEO, you're comfortable just banging out responses. How's the sector doing one to 10, you know? And how are you worried about solvency? Are you worried about liquidity? Then you, you might be comfortable doing that or if you're the CFO. But if it's someone, you know, in a finance office filling it out, then maybe less so. So I think that's one part of it. The other part of it is just language. I mean, we, we have this in three languages, actually four, because we added Arabic. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, interpretation of questions, mm. I mean, there's a lot yeah, of nuance that's true. there. So that's true. it's to say yeah. it gets, gets complicated. I think it's worth yeah. getting into and exploring, but it's certainly more difficult than these very standard mathematical indicators. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see, okay. So maybe we can have the perspective of one of you, uh, Fanny or Kevin, maybe Fanny, because you are in, I think this question is pretty relevant for the type of surveys you are conducting. And then Kevin, maybe you can intervene on the next topics if it's fine for you. <laughs> yes, um, so very insightful um, uh, words from, from Peter here uh, at the, at the FSP level and uh, an end client uh, level, I would say for advance, um, who is driving the decision of making of, of, of doing a field research is actually um, it's it's a lot at the at the FSP local um, uh, level. Um, what we impulse and what we are driving at head office level is really um, the, the, the culture of asking clients what they who they are, how they behave, what they need, what their problems are. And we, we are creating this culture of being customer centric. And this is really what we want to drive as, as a head office team and, and central team. Then um, where I'm, I'm quite happy to say that it's a, a reflex that is quite uh, now uh, spread uh, across uh, the organization. So all our teams have this reflex to just like, if they want to run a project, if they want to, um, to create uh, an innovative product or service or, or even change the customer experience, uh, they have this reflex of, of, of going in the field and asking customers for, for their um, uh, opinion. What is more uh, difficult, and this is our role, and this is us driving that, is the methodology and the quality of the field research you're going to do. And uh, our role, in my opinion, is really to drive that quality up and to, to raise um, uh, and to build up those capabilities locally. So we've, we've. Uh, this is what very much we we drive. When uh, we want, um, and and this is a second example. When we want to um, run a survey where we want to compare the results across uh, our different uh, locations, our different subsidiaries, or we want to compare ourselves uh, uh, to our competitors or, or uh, to, to the sector, then it's very important that we at, at head office make the decision and drive uh, the survey as we did for the satisfaction survey, but also as we did for the impact survey on the COVID-19. So it really depends on first um, the objective of the survey, who is driving the decision, but it also depends on how are we going to use the results. And I think this is one of the uh, the element that Cerise was was uh, sharing in the in the chat, but the the one of the key problems we have is, is then how 
how are we using that insights that we are getting uh, from uh, the field and, and from clients? Um, how can we make sure that uh, the way we are going to analyze the results and the way we are going to um, share it internally uh, is going to drive the right decision-making process and is going to drive um, the right discussions with our financial partners, with our peers, etc. And I guess this is what we at at um, at, at head office level needs to to drive more and and build more internally. Um, when we have to compare ourselves, it is very important. And and I I join um, my my colleagues here saying that it's very important that we have harmonized data so we can compare ourselves. So if I say. For example, I want to um, uh, compare the, the vulnerability level of my clients in Nigeria compared to the Ghanaian uh, clients, or I want to make sure that um, I can assess the level of poverty of my uh, clients in my portfolio in, in Myanmar compared to the market. I need to have and to use relevant and uh, uh, well understood um, or, or well spread uh, indicators and KPIs mm -hmm. uh, and, and used by like not only advanced because otherwise it's very difficult to make sure that we can understand what's going on in our portfolio. So I think those are the, the two, three uh, topics I just wanted to, to share with you on, on that question. Okay, there would be much more to say. But yeah, I, I guess maybe we will organize uh, se other sessions later. <laughs> but you said something very important that data quality is key. Uh, also to make sure MFIs appropriate uh, the results because sometimes they can uh, mistrust actually this kind of work when you are organizing it. We, we had this issue, for instance, with one MFI which was involved in the survey on uh, the impact of COVID crisis on the end clients. They were not sure the, the results were, were true, at least uh, of a uh, um, uh, high quality as the, the information they get from the field, from their officers. You know, they, they were not sure it was uh, yeah, the, the same quality. So this leads us to our second topic, which is on data uh, collection methodologies. So it would be interesting to have your experience using these different methodologies, external parties versus internal staff. Uh, in our case, as I just said, th there could be some issues with trust from MFIs when it's done by external parties. But in terms of data quality, what is your experience? And uh, using specific tools or platforms just as type form for the Pulse survey. You are using SurveyMonkey, Fanny, uh, at your side. We are trying to use Kobo Toolbox on our side now. So do you want to share your experience uh, with these um, different methodologies? Maybe, Kevin, you could start on this question. Yes, thanks. I just want to add something to the previous question, if I may, is that okay? <laughs> um, yeah. And that is uh, with the, the previous question about, you know, who, who initiates. Uh, one of the things in March, which we realized, uh, of course, um, at let's say at the um, investor level side, you want to know what is the liquidity and solvency, uh, you know, the risk levels at MFI uh, level. And MFI actually needs to get that data based on the risk, et cetera, of their clients, right? So um, in addition to trying to, to get, to help those MFIs that didn't have maybe access to that kind of data on their clients, uh, what we did really do is try and get the best in class uh, in our um, MFIs to share what they were doing because everyone was kind of in shock in March, right? It was like, uh, oh my gosh, what's happening? And we cannot look further than one week ahead or something. So um, in Latin America, we have a Spanish uh, language version with uh, probably about 80 or more, um, actually it was more than that, 100 MFIs, where three would just say what they were doing so that we could kick the others out of the maybe the shock <laughs> and see, all right, that's what we should do. We should do it that way, or we can do it that way. And we also then promoted the Finca and the 60 decibels. So at least they would know, all right, there is options to go. Uh, so that's uh, uh, just a little bit on follow-up on the first question. And on the, the second question on the uh, external versus the internal um, staff, um, I recognize what some of the things that you mentioned in, uh, definitely on internal staff uh, collection of data. Um, and that's why an external party would be helpful, definitely um, more costly. And the, 
what we're really trying to do is get sustainability. But obviously, in a time of crisis, you also want to move fast. Uh, so if you if you have the funds and you can get an external party to do it, uh, it adds uh, a, an extra layer. I'm trying to think of um, that, let's say that the best in class partners that we got to share with the others actually already had quite sophisticated internal uh, systems to do surveys, including uh, telephone surveys. Uh, of course, we didn't have a method to like to check. Uh, the let's say the, the validity uh, of um, in the other um, when you have more time like we did with the client uh, outcome survey then you can see where the inconsistencies are and, and you can help uh, correct those um, the, um, the I think the phone surveys uh, work uh, the best um, provided you can get the language uh, that you need right um, and um, yeah, so that's what something that 60 decibels offers. So uh, we're definitely uh, supportive of that. And of course the costs are, are again the issue, uh, particularly because uh -huh. you don't want to have a one-off. You need uh, sequential um, surveys uh, for, for this time, this period of time when things are also so different, even within a country, right? It's, uh, the effects of COVID were very different. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I have to agree with that. On our side, we also think that phone interviews is a good compromise. Actually, uh, of course, there is the issue of language, but as you said, when you go with external parties, you have to select them to make sure that they speak the proper languages. Um, on our side, actually, as I said. I, using external parties is uh, convenient to go fast <laughs> and to make sure you, especially when you don't have the resources internally in the FSP, but the, um, yeah, the other side is that it's more complicated for MFIs to appropriate the results and sometimes even to trust the results. But um, yeah. And Can I just add, add yeah. something on, on that? And uh, sorry, I thought oh, you were going to yeah. another topic, so <laughs> no, no, <laughs> I didn't yet. want to get you. <laughs> no, no, not yet. Um, not really. uh, no, the, the 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 point on the phone interview. I I was actually quite. Um, I was not convinced at first when when we were we are talking about impact survey uh, that phone interviews would would actually. Uh, do the job <laughs> mm -hmm. because phone interviews is quite impersonal and in some of our countries we could see that we had response rates very low because people don't want to talk over the phone with someone they don't know mm -hmm. um, about the level of their revenues of their spendings the level of of vulnerability that they are facing etc so uh, it, it feels like it's working quite well and and that could have not been done internally actually i think it's because 60 decibel has developed this strong methodology uh, that said if uh, we wanted to do like an impact survey on like our product and services for example and we wanted to do it uh, with either internally or externally i would probably go for a methodology where, where it's face-to-face -face interviews and in-field research because it provides you in the context of the client uh, with much more uh, qualitative information than phone can actually ever do it but it always it's always a trade-off between uh, quality and and uh, and uh, the, the context of the survey and the the, the objectives you're, you're trying to reach yeah and quantity as well because uh, yeah. going with the phone you can interview more more people exactly. yeah, yeah. Uh, Peter I think you wanted to share something about the the tool you are using with the pulse survey yeah, happy to. Uh, and if you want, you can pull back my yeah. slide. And yeah, then I will. Press I'll try. <laughs> Sorry, you have to go backwards. No, no, <laughs> no problem. No problem. Okay. There you go. Yeah, so we use a digital tool called Typeform, which has a, a number of strengths. And I thought it was just useful for people to get a feel for what it looks like for the for a respondent while I'm, I'm going through. So there's a line there, and that's automatically populated by the name of, of the MFI. Um, but we really like Typeform. It was a new thing that we, we tested out that we hadn't used before. We looked at different options. This one offers a really clean and simple and intuitive interface uh, for, for respondents. It works beautifully on mobile devices, as you can see, but also translates really seamlessly to PCs and tablets with no extra work. It just works across, right? 
It's designed for touch screens and built to navigate with swipe and tap, but also the keyboard. It also makes it extremely easy to build the instruments. It's literally like you're writing a Word document and the instrument just builds itself. Um, it's super easy to build internal skip logic to create and use recurring variables, stuff like that. Use this sort of pre-made building blocks that you can tailor and assemble very, very quickly. And it's, it's super intuitive. Um, it also has reasonably good post-production tools. You can export in different formats. You can automate jumps to Google Drive or whatever you need to do. Um, and, and decent analytical tools. So you can see which questions people struggle with. Uh, are people, you know, taking more or less time on different formats and platforms and, and stuff like that. It does have some limitations because it's so streamlined and simplified as well. So if you want to do something beyond the building box, you may or may not be able to. You can't change certain certain aspects of the building box. But overall, I think uh, you know we we had a good experience with that tool. Um, we uh, in terms of the data collection to your questions there, uh, you know we partnered with MFR for this. They're well known in the space and already host. Atlas and, and they've been just extraordinary right from the start and throughout this effort, they could tell you a lot more about actually implementing uh, Typeform if you want to know. I know Lucia is is on the chat, which is which is great. Um, they they have quite a unique combination of skills, uh, which was a great fit for us, including very strong technical skills on the IT side and a, and a flexible platform that really made our our lives uh, a lot easier. In addition to the sort of core experience around um, financial analysis of, of MFI. Um, in terms of the source, uh, we opted for self-reporting as the primary approach, as I mentioned. There were a couple of reasons for that. One is it's just faster to go straight to the source, uh, and the other is these qualitative questions that really can only get answers to from, from MFI themselves. We did also enable indirect submission uh, by headquarters, funders, associations uh, that could sort of submit, batch submit even data on, on Excel. Uh, but we never really got got traction on that, and and MFR actually built a simple importer to just pull it straight in the database, which which was great. Um, but uh, but the direct one is the one that actually yielded the most results uh, in the end. Okay, thanks. So I think we just have some time for our last topic. So let's move on to the third question, which is not, which is the last but not least, actually, uh, data analysis and use. So um, simple question, where do you see the main challenges uh, to analyze the data and to make sure these data are used, both at your level, maybe, but also at the FSP level? And what solutions have you found or tested? So I know Kevin already introduced a uh, sort of solution with their TA on this specific topic. Uh, but maybe, Fanny, you want to start on this question? And then we'll let the others... Complete. Yeah, it's it's definitely one of the key topics we are working on right now. If I take the example of the 60 decibel survey, so all countries and, and CEOs were really, really eager to, to get the results, but the, 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 the amount of data that we got uh, had to be digested, uh, basically. So we did quite a lot of work uh, here at head office to just uh, understand the data, make it simple to, uh, to, to communicate internally, organizing working session with our teams uh, in each subsidiary uh, to give them back the data, to explain the data, to give them perspective with other data that uh, had been gathered by 60 decibel and uh, other data from other countries. Um, and then we had really discussions around, okay, so what do we do next with those data? Because it's very important that uh, they could understand it, but also think about um, if I get an answer saying that 80% uh, of my customers are actually telling me that they feel their situation is, is far worse than it was uh, before the crisis, what do I do with that? And so we also worked very closely with the rest of the team, the risk team, the business development team and the, the, the sales team to make sure that all those information could be also digested and well understood by uh, our customer relationship officer, the, the people who are in, in contact with our customers every day. Uh, so that they could have that as a, as a background when they were discussing um, uh, the situation with the clients, uh, those who couldn't repay their next installment because of the situation, those who needed a refinancing um, or rescheduling uh, option, those who needed a top up to restock their activities. So all this um, was, was something that we 
it's still work in progress. We are um, expecting the, the next wave of results from the 60 decibel impact survey. And so I, I guess this will also be uh, very important for us to improve again <laughs> what we have done to make sure that those results were, um, were uh, used. But in, in a nutshell, it's always very, very um, important to put the effort and the resource needed when you get the results to make sure it's going to be um, it's going to be used. Everyone will always find um, uh, good graphs and tables uh, very interesting, but they won't necessarily use it, um, even if it's very well designed. <laughs> Yeah, I just want to add on that because we had the same experience. Actually, we had not expected that we should spend so much time uh, with FSPs to explain the results, even explain the results and give examples about how they could use them to make some decisions on specific products or services to offer to their clients. So this is indeed, it's not because indeed it's well designed that you do, do not need to spend some time explaining everything. Um, so yeah, on our side, we are also thinking about how we could do to make sure FSPs can rely more on their own data. So data coming from this kind of surveys, but also their own data in general, because actually if they cannot use these survey results, they cannot use their usual data either. And uh, maybe we should do something as OikoCredit is doing. <laughs> um, so maybe Kevin, you want to add something on that topic? Sorry, yeah. I was on mute here. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah I, I think the, the the problem is also, do you have when do you have time and when you don't have time? Obviously, the situation this year was you didn't have much time to prepare, mm -hmm. right? So usually you would you would have some kind of hypothesis that you would want to test with the data that you already have in the organization, right? Um, and here, the, that wasn't the hypothesis. That was just like, what's happening with our clients? Um, and then... Uh, what we did see is that, of course, you get portfolio information. It, some organizations have that in real time, and that's really fantastic for them. Others, there would always be a delay in that information. Um, so, um, so I think the main challenge is that, yeah, you had no time to prepare, and um, you just had to wing it with the information and what you had, um, and then things would change quite rapidly as well. So every complication imaginable it was there. Um, and then in terms of, uh, then, and then what can you do with the data that you have, right? Uh, because maybe next week, the situation might be slightly different depending on government regulation. So that really, really made it a difficult uh, situation. Um, what we did find was that the institutions that actually had quite a bit of contact with their end clients um, were able to just um, at least um, indicate um, some kind of mood, uh, it, it kind of gets to the qualitative side. Is there a mood of hope? Is there a mood of exasperation? Is there a mood of panic? Or is there a mood of, uh, well, you know, this is tough, but we've been through tough times before. And it was interesting for us to, to realize that, that for some institutions, um, things were tough, but they were not in a panic. You know, it seems like uh, we uh, in Europe were more in a panic than in some other countries. Uh, uh, that uh, where yeah you know they the, well this is a crisis but there's other different crises that they've managed to work with so um, then so I would just say that um, to continue working uh, with what we've been doing and then to to share the best practices because that really works the best so if there is a is the a peer to peer exchange mm -hmm. is still the best kind of exchange there is. So if there's an institution that does things uh, well and is willing to share, <laughs> that's another thing. And in terms of, in times of crisis, people are more willing to share. We found that as well. Uh, so to use that momentum um, and actionableness of data really requires a, a combination of data. Um, so the fact that you're combining uh, qualitative with quantitative is, is really good. Um, but then also not to make it too complicated. Uh, I think there is a tendency to do that. And maybe because a product or service change can be quite a simple change uh, yeah. based maybe mm -hmm. on a bit of information that uh, others had assumed something was like this, but then the data shows, oh, it's actually like that. Check it out. 
And then when you check it out, oh, it is like that. So then you can tweak and it's just going maybe to a slightly different area uh, geographically. That was uh, probably the easiest change to, to make uh, a different geographic uh, outreach. Okay. Long answer to short <laughs> No, no, thank you very much, don't worry. But I, I think we arrive at the end of the session. I just wanted to, to know with the, the host, uh, is our poll available? We had a, a very short one question survey for the audience, but I, I don't know if the host um, has the poll ready or not. If not, I will just to finish this uh, this session. Uh, I will just display. Yeah, it, you should see it on your screen. I think so. I have this last question for all participants. Uh, given all the the discussions we had, even if it was quick, uh, what do you think MFIs or FSPs need most for such surveys or research work? Uh, I know that some of you would like to answer everything, and uh, I'm sure we are several to. <laughs> So everything, but the idea is just to point out the most challenging aspect, let's say. So I would be interesting, uh, interested in knowing what you think is the, the highest need for MFI. So you can answer the poll. Um, we will let just a few, a few seconds, and I hope the host will be able to display the results because I don't think. I can do it on my side. Okay, perfect. It's Gabriela. I just take this opportunity to say thank you and sorry <laughs> to Edera, Natalia from Edera, and uh, Cecile from Ceres, who shared some uh, relevant information in the chat. I hope all participants were able to, to have a look on what was shared. Uh, Natalia has an interesting platform called Edera, which enables to collect data, so it could be. Uh, one of the solutions to, to provide to FSPs. And as I'm talking, we have the final results of the, the short poll. So interesting, interesting to see that you think that the most challenging aspect is data analysis. And I have to say that I, uh, I pretty agree <laughs> with this result, but very interesting. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for your participation. We may have other sessions on this topic later if there is an interest. I think there is definitely, definitely an interest and a need to share experience on that. So thanks again, and have a great conference this week. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Betty. Thanks to all. Bye. -bye.